Let's, uh, let's get started. <laughs> Pastor Brian is out of town. Listen, how many of you are feeling a little bit, a uh, little bit tired and, and, and oddly happy this morning? How many of you stayed up for the whole thing? Let's stand up together, brothers. Brothers, please. <laughs> if you're wearing Cubs gear or you stayed up for the whole game, stand up. Either way. Let's, oh, how fantastic was that? Yes. I, I decided, my wife and I stayed up and then it was, I, I was so excited, I thought, I gotta go, I gotta go to bed, it's, we, gotta have, we have team in the morning. And then I was so excited, I'm in the bed, I go, I just gotta watch the post game. So I watched all the interviews. <laughs> all right. I don't think we have any chance against the Dodgers after that game, but I'll take it. I just say that because I'm a Cubs fan, then they win, I get excited. <laughs> Haven't you learned by now, lower your expectations, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, we're, we're really grateful to be here. Thanks for all of you that uh, coming out, and it's excited to be with you. Um, I know that the theme uh, this year is really something that um, I, I hope and I believe God's going to use in, in mighty ways in our lives. Um, let me just begin with this uh, ridiculous joke that Brian sent me. <laughs> this is a team tradition, which, I, you know, there are, there are good traditions and there are bad traditions. After this joke, you can decide which one this is. One day, a duck walks in a store and asks the manager if they sell grapes. The manager says, no, we don't sell grapes. The duck goes home and comes back the next day and asks the same question, do you sell grapes? The manager says the same thing, no, we don't sell grapes. The duck goes home, comes back the next day and asks the manager if they sell grapes. This time the manager says, no, we don't sell grapes. If you ask me one more time, I'll nail your beak to the floor. The duck goes home, comes back the next day and asks the manager if he has any nails. The manager says, no, I don't have any nails. The duck says, good, do you sell grapes? <laughs> I don't know where he gets these. It's probably some of you. Last week's question, why am I here? The question of purpose. And today we're looking at a different question. The question, did God really say? The question of temptation. This is, uh, I think, a critical one in our culture, and certainly for us as men. We'll watch this uh, this scene from, uh, well, this is, I, I know that people say uh, the book was much better than the movie sometimes, and this is one of the cases where the movie's good, but the book is much better, although I always annoy, was annoyed when, some, when, when guys would say that, right? I remember seeing one comedian who said, people who say, the book was much better than the movie, uh, the response should be, oh yeah, you know what I liked about the, mo the, the movie? There was no reading involved. <laughs> but, but either way, this clip from the uh, Lord of the Rings. I've got one! Oh, I've got a fish me! Spangle! Put it on! Go on! Go on! Go on! Put it on! Spangle! Oh, my God. 
That uh, admittedly creepy scene uh, from the movie The Return of the King. It's the pre-story to the life of uh, that, that character Smeagol. If you don't know the story, perhaps you know the character Gollum. Let me get the lights up a little bit so I can see if anybody's still here. That's right, thank you, there we go. Um, Gollum is that, uh, that bald, disfigured, uh, pitiful character who's central to the storyline. And that is, Smeagol becomes Gollum. And the ring, the ring of power, you know the story, becomes a symbol in throughout uh, Tolkien's narrative. And remember, J.R.R. Tolkien, who, by the way, was good friends with C.S. Lewis, interestingly enough, uh, lived uh, during World War I, lived this between, saw World War I, in fact, served in World War I, and then lived to see what happened in World War II. And he wrote this story um, about the reality of human evil and the triumph of good over evil, but the ring becomes the symbol throughout, of the thread throughout of, of the corrupting power, uh, attempting power of evil, and what it does in Gollum's life is sort of like a metaphor for what happens in our lives if we give in to temptation, and that's clearly the case when you see how it corrupts him, but it, there's several scenes there where this ring exerts this power, and you think it's such a simple thing, such a small thing, such an inconsequential thing, and yet it has devastating effects on the lives of those um, who, are, who are influenced by it, and that's, I think, kind of his point. It's the small things, the little things over time that do the greatest damage to us if we're not careful. Last week, uh, remember, we, we saw that God created Adam. He put him in the garden to work it. He gave him a purpose. He gave him relationships. He gave him a place. He did all of this because he loved Adam and he wanted to create a good environment for him where he would relate to himself, God, in perfect relationship. He even gives him a woman to be his partner, his life partner, and together they have perfect unity with each other and with God. Then he also, as part of his good creation, gives Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, limits. He puts parameters. He gives them a place, he gives them purpose, he gives them a person, and he gives them parameters. How's that for alliteration? He puts them all, uh, these parameters around them because he loves them. He knows what's best for him. The limits, actually, in, in the creation account, are a reflection of God's love, not God's desire to hold us back or to test us, but because he loves us. If you have your Bibles or your, your notes there, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the beginning of the story, the first seven verses in chapter three of what we refer to as the fall. Original sin entering into the human story, the beginning of how things all went wrong in the world and in our story as well. And I think it's important to notice here that temptation, this story is about temptation, what happens. It's kind of an anatomy of temptation. Temptation begins with a question. It begins with a question. And this is always true, not just here in this ancient story in Genesis 3, but in your heart and in my heart, the times when we stray off course, when we end up in places we never intended to be, when we go wrong, it begins with a question in our minds and in our hearts. We're told here in verse 1 that this is the serpent. Now, Genesis does not identify the serpent, at least not directly. There's lots of hints. Later in the biblical account, we find out who the serpent is, this character, the serpent. And it's tempting for us to think of the serpent as, as, as a snake. Um, and that's how it's usually depicted in, you know, the, if you had picture Bibles in your kid or if you, in, in, the, in popular media, you know, a snake hanging in a tree, whispering lies in Eve's ear. 
Perhaps it was, we don't know. But later on, the curse is that the serpent will crawl on its belly. So perhaps prior to this, the, the, God's cursing, the serpent wasn't um, slithering. Perhaps it had legs. We don't know that to be true or not. But it, but it was also, um, we find out later in the, in the biblical account that the serpent was not necessarily something that looked devious or evil. There was no evil in the world yet. There was no reason to, to distrust. So I think for us, it's tempting to think, well, why would you listen to that? And the serpent turns out to be none other than Satan. The word Satan means adversary. We find out that Satan's a very real creature who's the adversary of God. And a little bit of background, if, you, if you're a fan of the great theologian Mick Jagger and his song, Sympathy for the Devil, it's actually pretty theologically accurate, most of it. I've been around for a long, long time, he says. He's not eternal. He doesn't have all power. He doesn't see all things. He's not unlimited like God is, but yet he does. He does, the Bible, the Apostle Paul calls in the New Testament, the ruler of this world for a time. He has limited power to thwart and, and work against the forces of God in this world for a time. But his future is, is certain. God has already determined that. Satan was once, Isaiah 14 and Revelation 20 indicate that Satan was once one of God's created beings. So he's not eternal. He, he had a beginning. That he was created by God and he was one of the angels. Uh, and and the, he led, uh, his name at that time was Lucifer, which means bright morning star. That he was the most beautiful of all the angels, second only to God. And that he led a third of the angels in heaven in a rebellion. This is all before the creation account comes into something in the cosmic world with, with the heavens with the angels. Lucifer, the bright morning star, one of, the, one of God's created beings made, made to worship him, rebels. Leads a third of the angels in rebellion. And God, in his sovereignty, casts him out. Casts him down. And that's essentially we see the work of the adversary, Satan, and his forces working against the forces of God in the biblical account and in our lives as well today. John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says, You are the f of your father, the devil, who was a liar from the beginning, the father of lies, Satan is called. Now you see this verse, um, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, You must not eat. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? There's the question. The phrase more crafty, it means more subtle. And I think this is important. Uh, temptation, sin, doesn't come to us like in your face, you know, do this terrible thing right now. It's much more subtle than that. It's much more insidious than that. It, it's sometimes unseen even to us. And the question that's asked is what? You see it there? What's the question that's asked? If temptation begins with a question, what's the question being asked? Did God really say? Did you catch that? He asked the woman. Derek Kidner, his commentator on, the, on, the, on Genesis, says, Satan's question smuggles in the assumption that God's word is subject to our judgment. Let's talk about God and what he said, Eve. Did he really say this? And if he said it, did he really mean it? And do you know why he said it and what's behind that? Let's reanalyze what God said here, and let's, let's pass judgment on whether or not that's a good thing for you, whether or not you can trust that. It all begins with the question, did God really say that you cannot eat of any tree in the garden. Now, temptation begins when we question God's love and God's limits. Even in the temptation, he doesn't come right out and say God's a liar. He says, did God really say this? And, and of course, in that question is what? A twisting of what God said. A subtle twisting, because God didn't say that. Sin always begins in our minds. It always begins in how we think, which leads us to how we act. Eve, Eve's being drawn into Satan's line of thinking, isn't she? She's already beginning to waver. I think um, this lie, this idea of the lie, this temptation always not only involves a question, but it involves a lie. In the question, the next one, temptation involves a lie. In the question is embedded the lie. Did God really say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Of course God didn't say that. And Eve gets part of that right. But this is true in our culture. To even, even in smaller ways, temptation always involves a lie. I think advertising, uh, apologies to those of you who are in advertising or marketing, right, is the, is the, is the nuanced version of, of crafting the lie, spinning it a certain way. Here's a few examples from Maybe a, by, a bygone era. Can you f I used to play a game with my kids when they would watch commercials on TV. Uh, Pastor Brian actually shared this with me, and I did it with my kids when they were young, called F Can You Find the Lie? 
listen to commercials on, on television, and can you find the lie? Um, so in this one, to keep a slender figure, no one can deny, <laughs> smoke lucky? And what does this toasted mean down at the bottom? Must have been a, a thing. And, and what's, what's wrong with her cheeks? <laughs> Cigarettes make you attractive, right? Can you find the lie? How about this one? <laughs> Cocaine, among other things, apparently cures toothaches. I suppose it would. Or this one. So the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. <laughs> this is, by the way, one of those for team only. <laughs> like, you are not to go home and say the pastor said. <laughs> I'm showing you the lie. In case, you're, in case you still have Cubs fuzziness in your brain, let's be clear. This is the lie. Don't go home and say, look, look what I learned, honey. Vitamins help your work harder, help your wife work harder and get cuter. Right? Or this one. Can you go back to the other one? Yes, no, 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 no. <laughs> I know your wife. I'm not, I'm not buying it. How, uh, this one, what's the lie here? We, seven up is good for babies. Well, we go on and on and laugh about that, but if you, I, I think it's actually something pretty interesting, not just for children, but for adults to play that game. Find the lie. They're all in our culture, all over the place. You know, there's a recent study that came out, not done by Christians, but uh, secular uh, sociologists and psychologists came together and studied the effects of Instagram on over uh, 14,000 uh, student, young people who are now late adolescents. And they said, uh, basically, I'll sum it up for you, there's clear indication that Instagram leads to depression. I mean, I'm just putting it bluntly, that the, 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 the spike in adolescent suicide attempts, in anxiety, in medication for depression and anxiety, coincides almost perfectly with the advent of Twitter, Instagram, and the rise of social media. And there's a whole lot of lies on social media, aren't there? A whole lot of lies. Look at their family. Look at that guy's marriage. Look at their kids. It's all lies, right? What's the lie being told here by the, by the serpent? Verse 4, you will not certainly die. Because Eve answers him. She says, no, no, no. God didn't say we can't eat of any tree. He said we can't eat of the trees, just not this one. Or else we'll die. And the lie, you will not certainly die. Now, he's, he doesn't start there. I think that's important for us to recognize. It begins with a question. It begins in your thinking. And then it's a suggestion. Did God really say? It's, it's, it's subtle. And then when she's sort of drawn in, he makes an accusation. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. This is a lie with the truth in it. Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, you were created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You and I were created in God's image to be like him. Not to be God, but to be like him. To take on his character, the character of his son. To follow him and to have his, his goodness and righteousness reflected in your life. You were made to be like God. So what does Satan say? God knows that when you eat this, you will be like him. Well, you were made to be like him but not this way. There's no shortcut, right, to sanctification or being like God. Satan is reinterpreting God's word. Think of it this way. He's saying, in a sense, Eve, God didn't mean what you think he meant. That, that thing God said to you, that doesn't mean what you think it means. In fact, there's, there's reasons you don't understand that I'm going to explain to you why that actually doesn't apply to you the way you think it does. Have you heard that in our culture? It's prevalent, isn't it? Well, you know, now we know. Now we understand that for centuries Christians have been wrong about this, whatever this is, and now we know why this doesn't really mean what everybody has always thought that it means. I, I, I'm not saying that we can't learn and we don't grow. What I am saying is, as men who are of the word and want to follow God, warning bells should be going off when we hear that. We should be going, wait a second. How do we know that? Is our age somehow more wise than all other ages? How many of you can remember yourself when you were 15? So we have to go back further than others, right? How about 25? Were you uh, more of an idiot at 25 than you are now? How many would say yes to that? How about 35? 
Maybe you were not as much of an idiot as 25, but were you more of an idiot at 35 than you are now? How about 45? Some of you are like, I, I hope I'm better then. Right? <laughs> if every decade of your life you could look backwards and say, boy, I was an idiot then, but now I know. What does that imply about 10 years from now? You are currently where you sit a fool to your future self. <laughs> right? Some of you can look back on yourself now and go, I was an idiot. Now, we don't want to be the same kind of idiot decade after decade after decade. But we're always growing, right? And I think there's this hubris about us sometimes to think, well, now we know. Now modern science and psychology and sociology and whatever else, now we figured this out. Have we really? The people of the biblical era, the writers of Holy Scripture, those who lived centuries before us, may not have had some of the technological advances, but they didn't have IQs of 10. We can learn a lot. Anyway, my point is, Satan comes to Eve and says, you don't understand why this doesn't mean what you think it means. You can't trust it. And I just would say to you men who want to follow after God in this world, in this culture, we should be very careful about believing that lie. You will not certainly die, he says. You can't trust God. So how does Satan lie to you today? How does Satan lie to us today? I think the same lie with different phraseology is present. Right? You can't trust God. What is he really saying to Eve here? What is Satan really saying to Eve when he says, what's, what's the implication, men, when he says to Eve, God knows that if you eat this, you'll be like him. Your eyes will be opened. What's he saying about the character of God? In fact, this is not in your discussion questions, but I'm, I'm going to break with the outline for a minute. I know team follows a template, but hey, the Cubs won last night. I'm a little loopy. We're going to do it different. <laughs> Take a minute. We'll come back. Well, this is not part of the actual discussion. And around your table, see if you can come up with what is the, what is the attack on God's character that Satan is implying when he says, if you eat that, God, God, if you eat that fruit, God knows you're, you'll be like him. That's why he told you not to eat it. What's he implying about God? Ready? Discuss amongst yourselves. What would you say? What is, the, what is the serpent, Satan, implying about God to the woman? When he says, you will not die. Now, that, now that's true and not true, right? Because she doesn't die immediately. But death enters into the picture. Death and corruption does enter into the human story. What is she saying? What does he say when he says, you will not die, you'll be like God, your eyes will be opened. What, she, what is the Satan saying about God? Thoughts? He's, you can't trust him. Yeah. The father of lies is saying, actually, God is holding back on you. He's not, you, he, you really doesn't have your best interest at, at heart. Yeah, yeah, he created everything, but he also is trying to keep you in your place. And he knows that if you were to do this, you'd be like him, and he'd have, he'd have no control over you. You'd be free, in other words, from this oppressive system that he's set up. Yeah, think about that. What's oppressive? Woman, man, naked, not ashamed, no disease, no pestilence, sex whenever you want it, food for the taking, relationship with God. Like, it's, it, what's bad about what God made? What's wrong with what God created? And Satan says, you know what, you could have it better. Puts her mind on something better. Like what, you're missing out. You're missing out. God's holding out. You really actually can't trust him. You must look out for you. You must decide what's right for you. You must determine how you're going to live. And you really, it, it's up to you if you want to obey God's law. In fact, if you were to disobey this one, a whole new world would open up to you. All kinds of implications in that one little statement. You won't die. You'll be like God. Now, God made us to be like him, but not on our terms, on his we don't decide that, how that works. How does Satan lie to us today? Years ago, I've told this story before, but I had a man, um, actually I lived near him, we were neighbors. This was many years ago. He, he, his family was the Instagram family. Four boys, all good athletes, blonde hair, like, kind of like the coffee boys, except they were blonde. 
They look Swedish, not, you know. All good athletes in the community. Beautiful wife, good marriage, good job, successful. He coached my son, and my son and one of his sons were buddies, and were on the same Little League team. He was their coach. I was kind of witnessing to him, trying to get him to come to church. Anyway, fast forward, and stuff, he was distant. Things was, I could tell something was up in his life, but I didn't know. Maybe it was work pressure or whatever. Come to find out, he uh, has a, a relationship on the side, a whole secret life, hidden accounts, the whole thing. It all unravels and comes out, and he's like, I just think I, I, I'm going to leave her, his wife, and his boys. She, she begged him to meet with somebody. He said, I'll meet with Pastor Jeff. He'd never come to our church. He just figured I was a safe guy. He could meet with me. Then his wife would, you know, he could say, I, he could say I tried. Sat across from me and said, don't you think, Jeff, like he's teaching me now, he says, don't you think that God wants us to be happy? I mean, isn't it true that God wants us to be happy? I haven't been happy for years. And so I think I finally am just finally opening up to what God wants. And he wasn't, there was not a wink in his eye like I'm telling you, like I'm trying to mess with you. He believed this. He believed it. This was good for him. And this was the lie, right? How do you get there? I guarantee you on his wedding day he wasn't there. How, did he, how do you get there, to that place? I want to be happy, and the way from, to, to my happiness is to leave my wife and four boys. That's that. I wanted to reach across the table with all the love of Christ in my heart and choke him. <laughs> it's not about your happiness. The surest way to an unhappy life is to believe the lie that life is about your happiness. The surest way for you to be miserable in life is to say, I have to live for me. I have to pursue what's going to make me happy and fulfilled. That's the path to misery and enslavement. But that's the lie. And a thousand little lies we believe, right? Just, just last month I met with a guy who said he has been neglecting his wife for years. Not abusive, not unfaithful, just not there. She finally couldn't take it and moved back home, which is in this area. And he was in and out of work and finally could find stable work on the other side of the country and comes back and says, look, I have a job. I have, we have a home. She's supposed to be the submissive wife, right? Submit to me because I'm the leader of the family and come out here. And I meet with them. And she's like, listen, I, I want to trust him, but I, we've got 15 years of not so good history. I'm afraid to take our girls and go across country. I'll be abandoned again. I'll be neglected again. I'm, I'm, I want him to move here. And they're at this impasse. And he's looking at me like, Pastor, tell her the Bible says she has to move, right? What would you tell him? What would you tell that guy? What would you do? What I told him is, fight for your wife. I've never met a guy. I've not been with somebody at their, death, their deathbed or near death or the end of their life where they have said, boy, I wish I'd worked harder. Boy, I wish my career was more successful. Boy, I wish I put more time in at the office. But I bet plenty who have deep regrets about things, decisions they didn't make for their family. And that guy's believing the lie that this is the, this is the path to us being a family again. No, it isn't. You sacrifice. What are the lies we believe? I, I remember one that my brother-in-law <laughs> said to me one time, he's like, listen, if, if my wife only knew all the people, all the guys that I work with, she would think I'm a lot better than she does. <laughs> like, that's your standard? All those meatheads you work with? Right? We believe that lie, though, right? And we begin to become resentful. Why wow, doesn't she recognize how good she has it? The kids will be okay. They're resilient. All kinds of lies we believe. Satan lies to us today by getting us to question the goodness of God, the character of God, the authority of God's word in our lives, even in subtle ways. Satan lies to us today by putting you above the word of God, meaning I stand above God's word and this is a good model for my life as far as it works, but I decide what I'm going to obey and not obey. I decide what, you know, really I'm the authority and this is an aid to my life. That's how most men that call themselves Christians operate today. This is an aid, but I'm in charge. And what God says is, no, the path of freedom, the path of joy is to say, I'm not in charge. He is. He decides. I don't get to make that discernment and that, that choice. And last, temptation always promises what it cannot deliver. Temptation always promises what it can't deliver. What does he say? You'll be like, God, your eyes will be opened. You'll know good and evil. Well, their eyes are open. The text says so, right? 
She eats, she eats some and gives some to Adam. And we've talked about this before, but let me just remind you in case you haven't paid attention or haven't been with us before. Uh, what ha- where is Adam this whole thing's going on? Well, he was busy at work, right? While his wife is messing up at home. Is that, no, where was Adam? She took some and ate and gave it to her husband who was with her. Verse six. Who did God give the instructions to? Who did God first give? Here's, here's, the, here's the parameters. Here's the limits. Who did he first give that to? Adam. Who does the evil one attack? Eve. Adam is with her. And Larry Crabb wrote a book years ago called The Silence of Adam. It's excellent. The weakness of men in our culture. We won't stand up for truth. We're silent and watch while the people we're supposed to protect are attacked in our culture. He's as guilty even more so than she is. Satan promises your eyes will be opened, and they are, but not to knowing good and evil, but to their nakedness. For the first time, shame enters into the human picture. There's covering up, there's hiding from each other and from God. Satan doesn't mention that, does he? He doesn't talk about the consequences at all. Death enters the picture. Her, her own children, Adam and Eve, uh, or excuse me, Cain and Abel, one will, bro, brother will kill brother. And that will be going on for all of human history. There are devastating consequences to her family, to her husband, to the creation, and to you and to me from this one act of giving in to temptation. And don't you think that little steps away from innocence in your life, little giving in to temptation in your life, aren't going to have lasting consequences in your children, in their children. We see it all the time. Temptation promises, you know, good, wisdom, enlightenment, happiness, health, success. It delivers the opposite, just the opposite. One of the things that drives me crazy, and I'll put you to your groups to discuss in just a minute. One of the things that drives me crazy in our culture is how men are portrayed in, in mainstream media. If you think about the the sitcoms we watched a generation ago, or even currently, or, you know, the shows that are on TV, how are most men, particularly married men, family men, how are we portrayed? Yeah. Morons. Beer drinking, drooling, coarse joking, sport watching. Well, okay, that one's true, right? (laughs) Just mooks. Just goofs, right? And and the wife is always a strong one, rolling her eyes like, I got to deal with this guy. And I, I think it, it's, it's, there's a subtle, like, it subtly bleeds into, like, that's kind of who we are. And, and the only thing that I think most men in our culture feel like, what I do is I provide. Well, what do you provide? Do you provide a life worth living? You know the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me as I imitate Christ? I look at a room full of approximately 200 men here. And, and I'm speaking to myself as well as you. What if we, what if we could say that? What if you could say, and it would be true, follow me because I'm following Jesus. Imitate my life insofar as it reflects Christ. Is your life worth following? Not the public persona, not the Instagram you or the Facebook you, but how you are at work, how you are with your buddies, how you are at home. Is your life worth saying, I want you to follow me? You know, in, in our culture, it, it, Christi- the, Christ- the church is the only place where I think this, sad thing, this reality is true. If you were a plumber, right? And you were learning, that you were a young apprentice, and you wanted to learn the ropes. If you went up to some guy who had been doing it, working on, turning wrench and working on pipes for 30, 40 years, and you went up to him and said, listen, I, could I follow you? Could I learn from you? Could you teach me how to do this trade well? And that guy said, I don't know anything about plumbing. Don't ask me. You'd think, what have you been doing for 30 years, right? It, you, that, you, it's, it's unthinkable. In your, in your field, you want, you, if you've been doing it 20 years, you should know something worth passing on. Why is it that in the church, if some young guy comes to you, to me, to us, can I follow you? Can I learn how to follow Jesus from you? Can I get next to you and discover what it's like to be a godly man? And most men, many, too many men that I talk to are like, mm, I, I know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not worth following. I don't know, I don't know that much. My life's not that perfect. We don't want that responsibility. Why? Our culture is dying, starving for men who aren't what, how they're portrayed. You know, the Bible says in, in James 4, 7, flee, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. In 1 Corinthians 6, flee sexual immorality. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, we're told that God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And by the way, this gets twisted. People quote this all the time, wrong. God will not let you be tested. Or not, God will not give you more than you can handle. Have you ever heard that phrase? God will never give you more than you can handle. Do you know that's not in the Bible and not true? Slap the next person who says that. Don't, no, don't do that. Right? It's not true. Of course he'll give you more than you can handle. You're not God. Life is more than you can handle without him. What, the, what the, the verse actually says is God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Meaning, you could never say the devil made me do it. You have a choice. Later on, the next generation at it with Cain and Abel. You know what's going to happen to Cain? Uh, he's going to be uh, uh, thinking about, angry with his brother and thinking about murdering him. And God's going to come to him and say, sin is crouching at your door. Genesis 4. It's desirous for you, but you can overcome it. He doesn't. You can we're not resigned to being idiots, right? God wants something better for you. And our, our culture needs men who aren't perfect, who aren't arrogant, but who are wholeheartedly, faithfully saying, I'm not in charge, God is. And I can live a life that, that's increasingly free from temptation. Because I'm not believing the lie, I'm believing the truth, despite what our culture says. Your sons and daughters need that. Your grandkids need that. Our church needs that. Young men who can look to other men and say, I, I want to be like that guy. That's a good thing. That's a, a godly aspiration. I know I'm gone over time, but, you know, I'm a preacher. I get going. So let's, let's turn it to our tables now. These questions. Before today, how would you have described your view of Satan? And in your opinion, what are the great lies of Satan in our culture today, particularly related, related to men? I'll give you some time to discuss, and then we'll, um, we'll have our prayer prompts.